Thank you. Okay, let's begin our next session. This is on civil resistance and human rights. And today I have with me two uh, dialoguers, if I may call you that. Uh, I think you know both of them by this time. Nicola Barak is director of Civic and New Media Initiatives at ICNC. And Mary King is professor of Peace and Conflict Studies, University for Peace. She is also a Rothmere America Institute Fellow at the University of Oxford. And uh, what I'd like to do is lead off with a question. And I believe Mary may take the first stab at it, followed by Nicola. And that question is, when we speak of the universality of human rights, a meaning that everyone would understand, what important dimension of its universal character is often left out? Thank you, Kim. Um, we have a very profound disconnect, disjuncture, between what we've been talking about for three days now, that is movements of nonviolent civil resistance, and the field of human rights <clears throat> that has developed and that has an enormous apparatus around the world. I mentioned yesterday that not one-tenth of one percent of the resources that have been spent on development, environment, and human rights have been spent on studying and researching civil resistance. The human rights field is enormous. We have courts of human rights law, we have academies, we have covenants, we have treaties, we have a vast body of law that's developed since the Helsinki Accords, which we'll talk about later. But the people who are working in those courts and in those fields and who are appearing as judges or who are studying human rights usually have no idea where they came from. <coughs> I hope you all believe me. I intend to prove it to you. The eradication of slavery occurred because of nonviolent movements on both sides of the Atlantic. It was not done by conventions and treaties in Geneva or anything happening in The Hague. The, Hague, the Dutch were among the slavers. It was ordinary people, and in both countries it was men and women who fought to end the trade in human cargo. European colonialism was ended in country after country after country by national, in many cases, movements of civil resistance. The press for free elections in order to become established as independent countries. This is very profound in Africa. In 1960, 17 African countries became independent. And most of them, I'm glad you're nodding because Kenya was among the ones that achieved free elections through a national mobilization. It was also Zambia. Ghana was mentioned yesterday. The civil rights, we, I, we've, we've talked about this. We don't have to say but too much. We have um, Jim Lawson with us and, and we can all see that this did not get taught in law schools. This was not something that came from lawyers. Although we did recruit hundreds of lawyers to come work with us in the South, that's because we needed defense. We needed people to go into jails. Three of my fellow workers were killed in the summer of 1964 in Mississippi. We needed to have lawyers. But the establishment of human rights was fought for by ordinary people, very ordinary people, illiterate people. The women's vote was fought for by one of the most remarkable transnational nonviolent movements of the modern age. Does anybody know what was the first country to grant the vote to women? Did I hear somebody? Just know it's Switzerland was one of the last. <laughs> Thank you. New Zealand in the late part of the uh, 19th century. But this was a multi-decade movement of movements 
sweeping across the world. Some of the first countries were China, Iran. In Japan, women first voted in the 1940s. All of these movements were movements of civil resistance. The vote for women did not get established in Geneva or The Hague or by conventions and covenants of international law. They had to be fought for by movements made up of people just like you and me. In the 19th century began various local and small struggles over various forms of injustice faced by workers. And we'll start with child labor. Child labor is ended through civil resistance. Factory conditions, working hours. We would all be working, I actually work seven days a week, so I shouldn't say we would all be working seven days a week. Uh, but most people would be working seven days a week without the battles that were fought by movements of civil resistance to have limited days of the week, limited work hours, struggles over tenants' rights, the right to organize, to use collective bargaining in seeking protections for workers. All of those came from movements of civil resistance. So that there is a very profound record of the accomplishment of civil resistance historically, and it's worldwide of eliminating fundamental injustices and creating better conditions for human beings. And as those rights became codified, they began to develop the teeth to make enforcement more possible. But for us now to be in a situation, Nicola, where we have lawyers and law schools never mention the indebtedness to civil resistance is, is a form of historical inaccuracy that's absolutely shocking. I throw it to you. <laughs> it's true, I was a victim of that. <laughs> In school, I did not hear about that. Um, uh, excuse me if I rely too much on my notes. I'm not yet a gifted speaker like Mary is. But um, I would like to turn the conversation in responding to the question towards um, how much the landscape of human rights has changed um, and what the dynamics are nowadays um, um, between the actors, the institutions, the organizations that make up that landscape and what that means today for civil resistance. And um, what Mary just talked about illustrates talking about human rights in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and today is not at all the same. And um, as she said, treaties, um, rights, standards have been codified, treaties and conventions have been adopted, mechanisms for enforcement have been established, and um, are part of this growing, extremely complex system uh, that increasingly encroaches on the sovereignty of, of states and the way that we understand the, the power of states. Um, and organized civil society groups were an essential and vital part of that. And um, in a way, it occurred to me, talking to Mary before as we were preparing this, this, this presentation or this discussion, it occurred to me that in a way, that history, these movements um, participated in almost organically participating, creating that universality, that character of universality of human rights. And um, so today, I was talking about the, the dynamics that exist today. We have a system that, uh, where we have an institutionalization of norms and processes. Uh, actors are professionalized. And we find ourselves with a wide range of actors from the local organized civil society groups to national, international, transnational, and international human rights groups like Human Rights Watch. And, and uh, um, Amnesty International. And um, in this, within this large spectrum, the question is really where do civil resistors fit in and what is their role within that spectrum and the dynamics that play um, within that. And their role is actually what I've identified as at three, at three, at three moments. Um, first of all, they're still vital and crucial in the norm-creating process, uh, finding and identifying and 
uh, finding new rights, for example, like the emergence of the right to water, for example, which is not even a right right, but um, so that's the norm creating process. Second, in the um, monitoring of implementation of these two rights standards. And then third, which is a step further, I think, sounds the same, establishing and realization of human rights on the ground, as in not only making sure of monitoring violations, but also in terms of parallel institution creation, um, making sure that human rights become a reality on the ground. Um, and so the next question is, so how do civil rights movement do that? <laughs> how do they fulfill these three these three functions, and um, they ferment pressure on the local and national governments. They leverage domestic civil society and worldwide opinion. They sometimes, each at their level, I was talking about that wide, you know, different spectrum of, of actors. They lobby international organizations and institutions. They, uh, these groups, even at the very local level, as this process goes on raise rights-related issues to the international level. And nowadays, we're at a point where uh, they participate in the agenda-setting process in the United Nations, which, if you think back 30 years ago, it's, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> but nowadays, it's, that's the case. Um, they pressure state actors to commit to their respect, to the respect of the standards that they committed to. Um, they sometimes negotiate and participate even in, in, in working groups and establishing these standards and the mechanisms that are supposed to protect them. And um, most importantly, they challenge state actors, which I think uh, is really important by monitoring and reporting violations, which also has kind of a, a preventive role. And then there's a really important um, post facto role, which is uh, groups that monitor and record human rights violations and know how to do so that they can later on, this can be used as proof in, in criminal proceedings after, after the, um, after the I could go I, on I, a little more, but. I, I would just like to say that I think all of us pay a very high price for the disconnect between an appreciation, understanding, and acknowledgement of the role of civil resistance in creating what we know today as universal human rights. And one example would be in the writing of history historiography. And when you have a situation where historians in virtually every society prefer to write about the wars. And so they do not go out and seek the material that is more profoundly important in the establishment of charity, justice, democracy, some of the points that Jim has been making. We all pay a price for that. It's not just in the advanced industrialized countries. It's African nations, for example, that achieved independence through nonviolent struggle, and people are not taught about it. I had a Zambian student in November who said to me, three quarters of the way through the course, I suddenly realized that the way we got rid of our president, who wanted a third term, was nonviolent action. She said, I didn't understand that. The churches in Zambia called for every Zambian in the country on Friday afternoon, wherever you were at 5 o'clock, pull over and honk on your car horn. <clears throat> and she said, all over the country, people were stopping, pulling over, honking on their horns for an hour. The traffic ceased. And eventually, the president stepped down from office. She said, I had no idea there was a name for this. And she said, I, she hit her head. She said, I'm now getting that we were all engaged in nonviolent struggle. But you see, that will not be documented in Zambia in that way. It will not have been reported that way in the media. Um, so I'm asking her, please, to write an article for a journal. And I'm going to try to see that it gets published. It's so important. But every one of you comes from a place where there are probably a dozen examples like that. We pay another price for it. The fastest growing area of the social sciences right now is conflict resolution, peace and conflict studies, the field that Lester Kurtz and I teach in. And yet you have no idea how many of our colleagues have PhDs in conflict resolution who know nothing about civil resistance. Am I wrong, Les? You're not wrong. <laughs> 
you're right. He's glad you. So imagine, we have this is the fastest growing area of the social sciences. So we have experts on conflict who don't understand that in some conflicts the worst thing you can do is to push for negotiations. Negotiations may grow out of a civil resistance struggle. Martin Luther King had to write his famous letter from the Birmingham City Jail to justify the use of civil disobedience, and he talked about the fact that negotiations can be one outcome of civil resistance. Resolution of a conflict can be one outcome of civil resistance. But to have a field that's disembodied from hundreds of years of a technique that has in many instances brought about more profound resolution of conflict. I mentioned on the first day the ability of civil resistance to go to the root of a conflict. Management of conflict is dealing with the symptoms. It doesn't have the capacity to go to the root of the conflict, particularly where there are great asymmetries of power. And then I mentioned yesterday that we are now in a situation where in the capitals of Europe and North America, there is no idea about how to help the process of democratization when it is guided by people power. Yes, governments know how to spend money on training election observers. Daoud, you know well the amount of work that has been funded in Gaza in the name of building democracy. But were a real nonviolent struggle to erupt in Gaza with rolling hunger strikes and hundreds of donkeys at checkpoints and so on and so forth, Washington would have no idea of what to do or to help it, even in the name of democracy. So I, just, I just want to say we all paid a very high price for this disconnect from our historical indebtedness to the technique of civil resistance. I want to um, jump in on and speak more about this disconnection because uh, I think there's a, there's a disconnection on several levels and it goes both ways. Um, the first thing that struck me when I joined ICNC was that I had never heard about civil resistance while I was working at the International Federation of Human Rights at the Observatory for the Protection of Human Rights Defenders. First surprise, I was like, okay. <laughs> and um, then the second thing that surprised me when I started working at ICNC and learning more about civil resistance, that we weren't speaking about human rights mechanisms and how human rights law was offering a wide range of tools that could be leveraged in a strategic way. So that was my second surprise. And then I thought about why this disconnect happened and at what point, why do these two sectors not talk to each other? And even within the human rights community, the, the actors sometimes don't speak to each other. And one of the aspects and one of the reasons is that um, the established human rights organizations that exist today and the institutions work within a framework that they have, as we just talked about, helped establish and create. So we've had this evolution of institutionalization and professionalization of actors and institutions. And, uh, but it was within the, a state-centric framework. So they had to you know, work within that. And now these organizations like Human Rights Watch and um, the International Federation of Human Rights and Amnesty International, they work within a framework that is state-centric, but that they helped create, so they work within it. And so that, in a way, you know, participates in that disconnect. And then there's another thing. Um, there's one instrument. So, so the international community in, in, in the realm of human rights law um, they've tried to grasp the, um, as the emergence of the individual on the international level. And um, they've recognized the importance of what they refer to as human rights defenders. And there's a declaration that was passed in, by the General Assembly, adopted by the General Assembly in 1998, called the Human Rights Declaration, the Human Rights Defenders Declaration. I'm going to spare you the actual <laughs> title of the declaration, because it's, it's about five lines long. But um, what's interesting about this declaration is that it's, um, I see it as an effort for the international community to, to approach the phenomenon of the role that organized civil society plays. And um, to come back to your comment about how in the capitals of Europe they don't know how to deal with civil resistance, 
um, there is actually a uh, guideline that was adopted by the European Union um, on the declaration, the Human Rights uh, Defenders Declaration, um, that were dispersed, that were given to their embassies and to their in, in third party countries on how to interact with human rights defenders, how they could help them in the system. And I think that's a start. I'm not saying that they're even close to understanding it. And again, the definition of human rights defenders in itself shows, um, it's again a symptom of that disconnect because the interest of the, the state is to limit uh, in the whole construct, in the negotiations of treaties and conventions, it's the interest of the state to limit um, the application of these conventions. So there's this tension between you know, what they're supposed to be applied to and the interest of the states that can manipulate what goes under that umbrella. And when they created this definition of human rights defenders, um, I've always been telling, talking about how I thought it was so limiting because it's supposed to be excluding political actors, political activists. But uh, yesterday I read in that commentary that it was a wide definition, <laughs> which I thought was a little, was um, optimistic that they interpreted it that way. But um, for anybody who's interested in, I think what I want to say is that the Human Rights Defender Declaration is an interesting um, connection point between international human rights law and our field in the sense that it kind of bundles existing rights and freedoms that are already internationally recognized and protected and um, bundles them and is, it's also, since it's a declaration, it also sh demonstrates the, the growing awareness of the important and vital role that organized civil society has in the norm creating process, but also in the enforcement process of human rights law. Do, do you think this in any way diminishes the historical perspective, this, this bundling, or? No, I think, and I think that uh, it, it, it's part of the on-the-ground phenomenon. There are now beginning to be tools that are available to reach that goal. So you mentioned something interesting about professionalization, and, and Mary, I'd just love to hear, uh, just building up what Nicola was saying. Um, is professionalization of, of any of these disciplines that have been mentioned in the last two days, is this something that is you know, f furthering the, the causes that underpin civic resistance? Or is this something now that potentially is getting in the way? Well, we need to think about civil resistance as something that is potentially always available. It, it's a capacity that uh, we as human beings have to seek justice and correct grievances that doesn't rely on violence. So, if institutionalized politics in your part of the world is working exquisitely, the parliament is extravagantly responsive. The courts are prompt. The police are clean. Check. Arrive. Check. Check. You, you, will, you will not need civil resistance. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not something like a pill that you have to take every day. It's, it's, it's something that we need to know and needs to be available to us. And many scholars who work in this field I think it's more important in democracies than it is in dictatorships or tyrannies. Because in democracies, you absolutely cannot have groups going off and arming themselves in order to sort out their grievances. So I think that professionalization is, uh, is, is, is a part of an ongoing process. It's just that those of us who are becoming aware and um, learning more about this need to keep our eyes wide open. I would like to make a little segue to the question of the social contract because, speaking of professionalization, some of the professionals who are in this room are here to become more professional on this field. And so, uh, is, is, it a, is it too much if I use this microphone on top of what I've already got? I, I, just, I, I just want to make sure that we all leave here able to use this terminology. There is something called the social contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of heads nodding. You've all heard about it. 
just want to give you a very, very brief historical taste. In Edinburgh, Scotland, in the 17th century and the 18th century, there was a group of historians and economists at work. And they began deliberating about the origins of government. This is where the term civil society comes from. It has been used at least a thousand times in the three days that we've been together. I just want to take a moment. Now, we're so happy to have you, see Sean, here with your background. And you, of course, are well familiar with this. You should be up here giving this part. I'm going to read you just a few words. This is from David Hume, writing in 1748. And he says that human beings, nothing but their own consent could associate them together and subject them to any authority. The people, if we trace government to its first origin in the woods and deserts, are the source of all power and jurisdiction, 1748, and voluntarily for the sake of peace and order, abandoned their native liberty and received laws. Now, what these historians and economists worked out was the idea that all of us left on our own, fighting for the resources we need for human life, we would be beating each other up all the time. We'd be smashing each other over the head, we'd be fighting, we'd be trying to acquire the food and necessities that we have that we have need of. And so what we do is we voluntarily turn over to government the control of violence. And in return for that, the government agrees to give us certain safeguards and protections. That's the social contract. It's as simple as that. He says, if this, the original contract, it cannot be denied that all government is, at first, founded on a contract. And then I just want a few more words. He's talking now about philosophers. Philosophers assert not only that government in its earliest infancy arose from cons consent and the voluntary acquiescence of the people, but even when it has attained its full maturity, it rests on no other foundation this is foundational to civil resistance. This is the consent theory, that all systems rely on the consent of the people. It's not original to scholars of civil resistance, like Jean Sharp. It begins in this concept coming from Scotland in the Scottish Enlightenment in the 18th century. And then he goes on to say, and then speaking of the sovereign, because of course there was a monarchy the sovereign promises certain things in return, and if he fail in the execution, he has broken the articles of engagement. He has broken the, civil, the social contract and has thereby freed his subject from all obligations to allegiance. And here's the good part. According to these philosophers right there in Edinburgh, this is the foundation of authority in every government and such is the right of resistance possessed by every subject. Because if the social contract is broken, we as uh, citizens who have voluntarily turned over to the state the control of violence, we have the right to resist when the social contract gets broken. I just want you, you're using these terms. Civil society originates at this time. It's all pervasive. It's so important to us because most movements of civil resistance come from within civil society. Now, they don't always. I want to give you one exception. One exception. In May, thousands of off-duty police officers in London took it to the streets in a rare display of anger against the government's austerity program. They joined a protest of public sector workers, including immigration officials, healthcare workers, and prison officers. Budget cuts and an official report that recommended allowing officers to be fired, reducing their pay, and so on, had caused them to turn out. Now here's, here's what's really going on. Here's why I want to bring this ex exception to you. 
these are police who are off duty. 80% of London's police joined this nonviolent demonstration. They were policemen, but they were off duty. They had finished the shift. And they went into a nonviolent demonstration. So nonviolent resistance doesn't always originate from civil society. In this case, it originated from within the governmental sector. Wonderful. Nicole, would you like to respond to uh, this question? How important is the social contract today? Um, I, I actually think that, that Mary did a really good job of that discussion. Because if we start talking about, like, because the, basically the social contract is the sh the sh this shift, that the paradigm shift that operated from authority to consent was what eventually made the conversation about human rights possible and the emergence of human rights possible. And from there, we can, of course, start ca talking about you know the naturalist approach to human rights, or do human rights even exist? But I th I'd rather think, yeah. go on, because All we have right. such little time. So, so I'm going to move on to a yeah. I'm just going to say one other thing, sure. if I could. Don't get hung up on the, th these are Western ideas. You know, baloney. For the last three days, we've been dealing with Eastern ideas. I mean, ideas are ideas, and you can't contain them. So, so much of civil resistance comes from India. In this case, we're indebted to the Scots. Don't yeah. fall into a false trap of saying, oh, these are Western ideas. This is now universal. Thank you. Actually, I, I, uh, you were going to. You took the words out of my mouth. Not, not calling the trap, actually asking the question. So I'm going to ask a completely different question, which is what is the what effect did the signing of the Helsinki Accords, the final act of 1975, have on human rights? And, and Mary, I'm going to turn to you for this. And the subsequent question, what was its effect on the national nonviolent revolutions in the Eastern Bloc? Could you just repeat the question? Sure. So what effect did the signing of the Helsinki Final Act of 1975 have on human rights? Okay. Maciej has just gone out of the room. That's good, because he's a real expert on this stuff. So I don't want him hearing what I'm saying, because I might be <laughs> slightly off. But in 1972, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe started and it brought together uh, all of the countries of Western Europe and Eastern Europe, plus the United States and Canada, to begin work on four baskets. Can you see, Neda? Four baskets of topics. Security was the first basket, economic, Scientific and environmental issues were the second basket. Humanitarian and human rights issues were the third basket. Follow-up was the fourth basket. Now, the Soviet Union had an interest in consolidating the acquisitions that it had made during World War II. They wanted recognition of the redrawn maps of Europe in which they had benefited by a massive land grab. They had taken the Baltic states, for example, by virtue of the Molotov and Ribbentrop Pact. Hitler's and Stalin's foreign ministers got up and cooked a secret protocol which gave Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania to the Soviet Union. So they wanted to participate in this because they thought this would dignify and legitimize their Thievery. Now, as time went on, Brezhnev protested the human rights basket. But as time went on, Nicola, help me. Can you erase these two? First two? The first two baskets and the last basket become inconsequential. They're no longer important. This one issue humanitarian and human rights basket becomes very, very important. The United States had something it wanted. It wanted the right of people to travel, very concerned about Jews in the Soviet Union who were unable to leave, very concerned about communications with families behind the Iron Curtain. So the United States wanted to cut a deal with the Soviet Union. And it, the Soviet Union signed what became 
the Helsinki Accord. And August 1, 1975, was the date of that signing. Now, at the same time, President Jimmy Carter in Washington was articulating a concept that human rights needed to be at the center of international diplomacy. And with the signing of the final act in August 1, 1975, there was now a Soviet signature on protections of human rights. This became the gift to people like our distinguished and humorous Polish Samizdat <laughs> writer. This was the gift all across Eastern Europe. People just like us began organizing little communities and, and committees. Helsinki Watch committees were set up all across Eastern Europe. And uh, in Czechoslovakia, the playwrights became very active. In, in Eastern Europe, the Protestant churches. In Poland, we've heard so much about solidarity. There had been resistance from the moment of the end of World War II, don't mistake me. There had been resistance all along. But the Helsinki Accords, the signing of the final act, with the Soviet Union's signature, gave protection for the beginning of the organizing under the rubric of human rights. So in this case, this was an extremely significant. Amachi, you've come back so that if I had made any mistakes, you missed them. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> this gave tremendous surge to the committees that were forming below the radar of official uh, monitoring often. Andres, you had an urgent question. No, just an urgent comment because I think it's very interesting about this, how I learned to the university that, you know, kind of, there was this idea in the Soviet Union of, we're not going to do concessions on security, it's a tricky modern uh, economy, and kind of the human rights have been taken so serious. So how it backfired. <clears throat> and how it was underestimated. Yeah, the that's what Brezhnev thought. Brezhnev thought this was something to sign and then forget. But once the Soviet signature was on the final act, this is all that was needed for little tiny committees all over to begin mobilizing. And so in Latvia, the first committee in 1986 gathers around the monument, monument of liberty. But they redefined what liberty meant. Liberty for them meant making the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, pact public and acknowledging that it was a secret deal that stole their country. I think that's about that. Would you like to read <coughs> um, I think that this example is a great illustration of the potential when movements can leverage these kind of opportunities like international treaties. And in a more, in a more general sense, um, the opportunities that can arise when a movement is when we, literal in international law and can leverage the opportunities that the whole system offers, maybe in terms of capacity or in terms of opportunities, like tactical opportunities like that the court offered. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details because I think because I figure will be some type of discussion. But maybe what I can say is uh, we've been talking with Nicole and Zishan, and if any of you are interested in talking a little bit more in detail in terms of what exactly are we talking about when we mean leveraging knowledge on human rights law, like for example, um, tactical litigation, human rights litigation, uh, tactical mapping, uh, what tactics exactly are being used by movements to leverage these mechanisms that I've been mentioning. So a little bit more technical conversation um, we're thinking tomorrow, dinner time, if anybody wants to join us and talk about it, that might be, uh, if you're interested. That's we great. So that we can have some type of discussion now. That, that would be great. I, so, so actually, I'd like to go from this important historical perspective to um, a question that leads from that, or, or comes from that, which is, should a right to resist be codified into international law? Well, this is a very interesting question, uh, and it's been posed several times and in many ways. Uh, there is a passage of the uh, right uh, to protect. The uh, Some of you have been involved in that. I remember reading in the R2P. Who here has been involved in implementation of R2P? 
Cohen in one of the biographies, the, the right to protect, um, the, 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 uh, this became uh, enunciated and agreed to within the international community. And taking off from there, it was then suggested that there ought to be a right to resist. And some scholars have looked at this and said it's not necessary. But the, 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 the question that I would throw out for all of you is we have a situation where there is continuing generation after generation barbarity and cruelty toward women and girls probably one and a half billion females on the face of the planet who have no human rights protections. They are sold into prostitution, they are forced into marriage, they are operated upon, they are denied education. I just want to throw out the question, given the extreme conditions pertaining for such a large number of human beings, whether even if technically it isn't necessary. Do we need a right to resist in order to give more strength, more backbone, more starch in the collar of groups that are working on child prostitution, female infanticide, forced marriage, trafficking of women? Can I add to that question? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I'll look here. What I would then add to that question is, what would that mean if there were a right to resist codified in international law? Would it mean that it legitimizes uh, further movements? Does it mean it legitimizes external external help, like the right to help? Uh, would it uh, would it protect those that are part of movements? Um, and then, at, as a next step, while I was trying in my mind to answer your question, and we we're having the discussion about the questions. Um, my reflex was to go back to the existing norms and standards and look, is there anything in there that already does that? And But maybe you should throw the question out in the audience and see if it's... And, and I'm assuming that includes who, who has the responsibility to well, enforce it. Well, who would have the responsibility right. to enforce it? Who, who, how would be determined who has, at what point it would be triggered, the right to resist? So, um, yeah, absolutely. So one of the biggest questions in international law is, is international law really law? And the reason they ask that question is because to enforce international law, no matter how well codified it is, is the biggest problem. So I think you are you are walking a very slippery slope when you talk about codifying um, the right to resist or the right to resist, uh, however, however you want to define it. Um, I want to I want to uh, make two more comments. Um, a couple of years back, some years back, uh, my uh, uh, my college took the risk of giving me a class on human rights, uh, which is considered to be the most boring subject. Uh, teaching it was a first year class, and they realized what I did. Anyhow, um, I you know um, uh, I I turned into somewhat of an interesting class and. Uh, um, but one of the topics that you, one of the uh, things that you mentioned about whether water is, Nicola mentioned, is whether water is, uh, uh, access to clean water is a basic human right. And uh, over the last 10, 12 years, we have seen degeneration of clean drinking water in Pakistan to an extent that uh, you, uh, in order to get, uh, I mean, uh, at most places, most, uh, most houses nowadays, water has to be bottled water because the, there is no concept of supply of clean water. Anyhow, so this this question came up amongst the students and uh, you know, the answer of course was there is no such human right as access to clean water and then students started asking themselves, you know, so what do we, you know, so what happens now? I mean, what do we do? We think water is, you know, a basic right. And so what do we do? What can we do? And you'd be surprised that these 19-year-olds, law is a first degree in Pakistan, not a second degree. Uh, okay, it's a second degree uh, after only two years of undergrad. So they're very young students in the class. And they start, uh, you know, they, they, they set up, and this was very novel uh, for students who were coming to college to set up uh, a petition, uh, get it signed in the schools, and start sending it to different groups. And uh, so I think this is one way in which, you know, uh, civil resistance and human rights is linked. Because even though 
water is not a human, a basic human right, as yet recognized in any constitution or international law document. It is, people do feel that it is a right, it is their right to have access to clean water. And it was amazing how, you know, a talk about a particular, whether something was a human right or not, translated into students acting on their own and, you know, uh, putting in an effort for it to be either recognized as a human right or at least put pressure on Nestle to stop, you know, and all those 15 upkeep companies that have sprung up in the last two years selling uh, bottled water, which totally, um, you know, uh, makes me mad. But anyhow, um, <laughs> uh, the second thing that I want to sort of uh, say is, um, I know, and I didn't thank you, Mary, and thank you for an excellent presentation. That was great, really good hearing from you. Thank you to see as well. Mary, uh, you know, I know you said, you know, let's not get lost into whether human rights is a Western concept. And I understand where you're coming from. Uh, but I would, with utmost respect for Western values, and I do have utmost respect for them, I've learned a lot from them. Uh, this is a huge concern, it's a prevailing concern in Eastern cultures, in Islamic culture. And I get this pointed out all the time whenever I use the term human right. And this is one of the reasons I'm not associated with any organization, is because this term, uh, whenever I use this term, there are negative sentiments. And you'll be surprised, uh, and uh, my friend from Jordan, she pointed it out uh, briefly earlier, that, uh, it, 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 you know, um, more uh, women, who, uh, women in countries like Pakistan, or, you know, the countries that are in Islamic culture, I feel are more empowered and you know, and men as well. Um, they sometimes get very upset when you start talking about their rights and start from the international human rights concept. Uh, and I agree with you completely, yeah. and okay. I would take that position. One mustn't start with what goes on in Geneva and The Hague. One must start with what is happening right there in front of you. So you talk about the child prostitution, or you talk about the female infanticide, or you talk about the water, or whatever it is. I would never use the term myself as an organizer. In that case, I agree with you. Aswan, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, I, I, I just want to comment on the, the social contract in line with um, uh, having a, a law or a, an instrument on the right to resist. I, I, I think the approach uh, you were uh, putting uh, David Hume, when we have a social contract, we should have at, at the same moment a social watch, which in some cases is called uh, uh, civil society, but I, I don't think civil society is enough organized to be a social watch for the social contract that, that uh, David uh, Hume is talking about. So the social, the social work will, will be uh, a kind of uh, uh, component to monitor the implementation of the social contract. And this is what, what uh, human rights activists and civil, civil uh, resistance activists are doing, is to make sure that the contract between the government and the society is being implemented. And when it is not, what to do? I do agree with the idea of having uh, uh, an instrument on the right to resist. Because in my view, it will, it will diminish or undermine civil resistance activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How so? Yeah, and I can stop this. <laughs> 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 oh, you don't want to say what? But how would it undermine? Yes, uh, I, I, I can go further and explain that. <clears throat> In my organization, for example, we have uh, a program on defending defenders, defend human rights defenders. It's a specific program for uh, human rights defenders who are in that country. The experience is <clears throat> we have had many people, for example, who expose themselves to human rights violations 
And then they come and they say, okay, uh, I am a victim of uh, human rights. So they want to be protected. But the, the idea behind that is not, they were actually uh, persecuted and they want to protect them, but it's for other reasons. It's one example. So you're afraid that it would be give, give cover for abuse? Uh, excuse me? You're afraid it would give cover for abuse? Yeah, exactly. Leah. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say, weren't you saying that um, that uh, civil resistance is not a Western concept and that and that human rights? It's not. I mean, the, right. the, the body of um, uh, development of theory it begins in South Africa right. with Gandhi paying attention to the African struggles going on around him. We know this. He's paying attention to what's going on around him in Africa and he's watching the Russian strikes in 1905. And then he returns to India in 1915 and further protects, uh, perfects what he had been thinking about in South Africa. So I appreciate Zishan's point, but I just want to he, say, he's no, saying we have human right, but there was yeah. a confusion because you were saying, because wasn't Zishan saying that, he, that he's human saying rights that, are that, that, human that rights the, are He's concept. saying the association of the term human right. rights with uh, the West, by right. which we mean the descent from the Romans and the Greeks, mm -hmm. right. is a problem in certain parts of the world, and it would be indeed. Um, and my point is not to get hung up on that, because in fact, ideas can't be contained and they can't be prescribed. My purpose in sharing the material with you is so that these terms that are in such common usage among those who are working in civil resistance that you at least have heard part of the dialogue from Edinburgh in the 18th and 17th century and understand the term social contract. A lot of South African uh, human rights uh, activists that I've met, for example, use this term social contract as if it were South African. That's great when it has that meaning for them. But what is your point? Oh, my point was just that I, I felt like the words were being used interchangeably because you said that civil resistance is not a Western concept and then Zishan said human rights are perhaps Western concept. So I was well, just, it was just a... And, just and we will find... Because they're very, because we have to, you know, we can't just talk about... I think we should avoid. And human I, th rights and I think we should avoid um, prejudicial labels, but can understand the historical antecedents or origins of an idea and appreciate it right. historically, okay. without becoming uh, tied up in it. Because the only way these terms are used all over the world is if they have meaning. If they have no meaning, they wouldn't be used. Lily, and then Paulina. I want to make just a small point, preventing future future disagreements and future misunderstandings. There's a hero of Molière comedy, Monsieur Jourdain. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, in the middle of the theater play, he realizes, I am speaking prose. He didn't know that he was speaking prose. <laughs> so there's a certain prose of human freedom, which was defined in Scotland verbally, but we have to define it really in real social life. So instead to fall in quarrels who was the inventor or who is big father of the of this system of values, it's better to say we are we want all to speak this human prose because that's a prose which is which sticks to our wills, to our beliefs, and to our system of values. And I think it's enough. We can stop on it. But thank you very much that you tapped upon Helsinki Titi because it's providing us, it's providing a certain issue from this angelic world to a real politics. Because we were using Helsinki Titi with refreshing hypocrisy, <laughs> knowing that Soviets interpreted in a wrong way, but we were pulling their legs, saying, you, look, you sign it, so just do it. We knew that they signed with bad will, but we could use it because they signed it. And it's, again, a return to the question of knowledge and skills. I stress skills.
I mean, this is a little bit different, and something I actually have been wanting to ask both of you as well as everyone here is more of uh, how, I guess, this language of human rights and civil rights has been sort of politicized. Um, because, you know, we're talking about the Helsinki Accords and how that allowed a lot of the, the movements in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet bloc um, to be successful. But at this very same time period, you know, the U.S. was manipulating a lot of these things in Latin America and in other areas as well. And so the, the bigger question I want to ask is how, how can we utilize this like, polit politics game of human rights to our advantage for our movements? Because it is happening, right? And um, I guess it's more of a practical question, but you know, even during this time, human, the human rights movement and the civil rights movement was very separate. They made sure not to really overlap too much because they wanted to keep it pretty effective. And they, I think they thought the more they mixed, it would kind of muddle the message and aims of either movement. Um, so I guess, yeah, it would, you know, these big political agendas of, of leaders can be to our advantage, but oftentimes they're not because we haven't used them. And well, 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 I would just, I would just yeah. say that when the United States uses hypocrisy, it's not refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, the I'm going to take Pauline's question and then we can respond to it. Yeah, it's just, it goes in hand with what you mentioned about um, more than the origin, I think the meaning or the usage that is given to the rights. Because I, there is one particular tension that I see very, very present all the time and which may be given attention, and that is the, the, the difference and the the usage of the different generations of rights. You know? How we, most of the times, or the hegemonic perspective is to give priority to uh, civil and political rights, which are individual rights, uh, regardless economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. And this definitely comes from a particular perspective of understanding these, what are human rights and what is humanity. I think this tension may be enhanced with what's been mentioned about uh, Western way of understanding these rights. How can we try to overcome this? I, I will give you a partial answer, Paul. Okay, I, I'm so sorry. I, well, it's, just, it's, one, it's one sentence answer. Okay. It, it, actually, the Constitution of South Africa is actually at the forefront, right? in my opinion, um, of defining rights right, right now. It's, it's not in the West, it's in South Africa. And I happen to know, although I cannot tell you how I happen to know this, that certain members of the United States Supreme Court read and follow the rulings going on in South Africa. They can't adjudicate with them. They can't use them in what they write, but they are watching what's going on in South Africa. So I would say the most creative shift now is to Ruby and to Shireen and who else is from? How many South Africans do we have here? Howard. Yeah. I'd say South Africa is really on the cutting edge. Yeah, we've got, a, we've got a good constitution. We're not very good at handling it, but we've got a very good constitution. <laughs> very good constitution. Probably everybody in the room can say yeah, the same sure. thing. Okay, Nicholas, can I make a final comment and then we're going to conclude? And we'll continue it on the cruise. Yes. Tim Ross. We'll continue on the cruise. Can I answer the next question? No, because I have to ask from you about the responsibility to protect. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, yes. To just answer your question real quick, um, the politicization has done a great damage to the sector, and especially to the work of human rights organizations, established human rights organizations, and I think the answer is grassroots initiatives organized civil society on the ground to get knowledgeable and to go back to the text mm -hmm. and to hold accountable on the text because you can't politicize too much the text. You see what I mean? In terms of instead of manipulating um, the, the political game that goes on, I think the solution is for grassroots movements to become more literate in what seems now such an obscure, you know, cloud of international laws or whatever and to make them effective because that's what's going to make them effective. It's not the other way around. And it's also a question of vocabulary. We talked about yesterday, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't make that point, but actually yesterday we talked about vocabulary that's connected to the development world and the capacity to connect it to sectors because of the vocabulary. It's exactly the same thing in human rights. 
But there, which it happens, you, just like yesterday we said, rights-based development was the beginning of the conversation on civil resistance. Um, rights-based movement is the beginning of a conversation on development, in a way. And that's where these two connect, and that's where they connect. I would just say, people don't live in sectors. People live in their reality. We have to remember that. Thank you to our two speakers.